So I'm Samir Kamar, and um, I'm a doctor, I'm an inventor, I'm the founder and president of a company called MedWand Digital Health. Today's topic for the unmentionables that we're sponsoring today has to do with the aging and the, their caretakers. Uh, it's a topic that all of you are going to relate to, probably, if not now, then sometime in the future. I myself have had some personal experience with that. About 10 years ago, when I first graduated from residency, I decided to open up a family medicine practice uh, in Monterey, California, not too far away from here. And uh, it, was, it was a great practice. Uh, I had a good time. A lot of the patients I had, though, were geriatric patients. It's just the nature of Monterey. And I found it very difficult for them to come to my office. They were at risk for falls, injuries. The, 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 there was a big liability for nursing homes who had to transport them. You had their caretakers who actually had to take a day off. So I introduced house calls, uh, an old concept, but revived it for my practice. And it actually did very well. It was probably the most successful version of my practice. And the only thing is that I was limited by time. Travel time was a killer. And I would spend an hour in the car sometimes to make a 20 minute house call. But it was a great experience. Fast forward to just a couple of years ago, I saw the rapid acceleration for the telemedicine and telehealth industry, particularly with video chats. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could actually examine a patient in real time during a telemedicine appointment? So I created something called the MedWand. It's a computer-sized, it's a computer mouse-sized device, a medical device that you have on your end. On my end, I can actually examine you. I can listen to your heart, listen to your lungs, look into your ear, nose, and throat, even get an EKG and your vitals. It's like a digital house call. If I had one of these back in Monterey, I would have probably made many more house calls a day than I could otherwise. Uh, I'll be launching this device tomorrow in a demonstration at launch. We're one of the finalists, and I'll be examining, examining a patient from stage hundreds of miles away. Uh, but for today, I'm very excited to introduce you to the companies that are going to talk about what they're doing for this very important population. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce you to the host of this event, Alexander Drain. Okay. So I have to start by acknowledging that this is the first year that we will be doing the Unmentionables panel without the extraordinary Susanna Fox. Yes, which, <laughs> right there. Um, and although that royally stinks, I think as we all saw yesterday, we have lost her to a higher cause. And so I'm trying to be mature and adult about it, but also hopefully, hoping that next year we can seduce her back to this panel. So my guess is by now most of you are familiar with the concept of the unmentionables, or it's cooler and prettier and more popular older sister, older public health sister, the social determinants of health. The concept, I think, is increasingly straightforward to understand and actually understood and discussed, which is that health is life. And when health goes wrong, life goes wrong, so we need to expand the definition of life, of health to include life. I think in many ways we are ignoring the most fundamental drivers or some of the most important fundamental drivers of what drives health, which is if you're worried that your partner is cheating on you, if your mother with Alzheimer's just moved in, and if increasingly the only answer that you can find is at the bottom of a glass or the bottom of a bottle, are you really worrying about your heart health? There's actually a framework that describes this. Um, is this rubbing? A little bit. I'm going to try and fix that. Hold on. Um, there's actually a framework that describes this, which is Maslow's hierarchy. And it's a very straightforward idea that perhaps what we're doing is expecting people to be operating at the top of their game. So get all your preventive health screenings and eat well and exercise and take care of your condition. Meanwhile, people's lives are falling apart. And for far too many of Americans, in fact, they don't even have the basics. So safety, food, clothing, heat, electricity, medical care, then in fact these things don't exist for so many folks. 
maybe a more technical way to describe this would be to say we are appropriately focused, most of us in our day-to-day -day lives, on these conditions, but perhaps ignoring the all-encompassing, what I will call life sucks disease, which is caregiver stress and relationship stress and financial stress and workplace stress. And when, we, when I was at Eliza, we decided to focus a lot of time and attention on really understanding this condition, if we can call it that. And what we saw was that these unmentionables are actually true for most of us. 95% of us are struggling with one of these at any point in time. 40% of us are struggling with between four and six. After we asked the question, is this thing true for you, we asked the follow-up question, well, how much is it bothering you? To what extent is it defining your life? And then we asked, and how supported do you feel by the healthcare space in it? And the delta between those two we called the ostrich index as a way of pointing out that maybe as an industry, we're putting our head in the sand about the things that actually matter the most to us. Now, you can look at the slide and see it's financial stress, bad sex life, relationships, caregiver stress, job stress are the biggest, have the biggest ostrich index, which could maybe make us feel depressed. Or as a room full of entrepreneurs, I would argue that what we should see there is glaring opportunity and stuff that maybe we should be refocusing what we're working on to try and address. We also came to see that when these bad things happened in our lives, there were certain activities or behaviors that if we exhibited them, they actually made us sicker. And we call these things magnifiers, and they were trouble sleeping, being sad or worried, or substance use. And we also saw that there were things that helped us be more resilient and helped us overcome when these bad things happened. And they specifically, we call them the buffers, were a strong network of peers, spirituality, and exercise. To sum it all up, the relationship between these two things, your buffers and magnifiers, was most predictive of health. And more buffers was good and more magnifiers was bad. What we wanted to do was to be able to measure this on an individual and a population-wide basis so that we could do a better job allocating our limited resources. So what we came up with was the concept of thinking of this as vulnerability, and by extension, coming up with a vulnerability index that measured the presence and magnitude of a life challenge that you yourself had against your personal balance of positive and negative coping factors, or your buffers and magnifiers. And then we rolled this out across large populations, and when we did, what we saw was that if you were highly vulnerable, controlling for age and gender, you were 2.6 times as likely to have diabetes, you were 2.9 times as likely to be experiencing back pain, you were five times as likely to be experiencing behavioral health issues, and you were costing the system five times as much. When we got started in this whole space, I think we felt like we were dancing a little bit to our own tune. But as we dig, dug into it more, what we recognize is, in fact, not at all. There's a whole cadre of people who have been working, toiling tirelessly and tirelessly in this space for a long time. I'll just call out the Kaiser Permanente ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences study, which was recently just corroborated. And over time, I think more and more folks have been coming into this space to the extent that we could now argue, perhaps finally, this is a, a, a thing whose time has come. The headlines in the last six to 12 months alone on the unmentionables or on the social determinants of health are stunning. So work stress is killing us. Financial stress is killing us. Relationship stress is killing us. And this one is my favorite. I don't know how many of you guys saw the study from Duke that came out in May that said going through a divorce is as bad on your health as diabetes or smoking. And I would guess a huge number of people in this room have worked at some point in their life on a diabetes app or a stop smoking app or a program that was helping you do that. But have any, has anyone in this room spent time working on, a, on an app or a solution or a program that would help me survive a divorce? Which if anyone in this room has survived a divorce, you know is really decidedly unfun. We're doing more of the bad behaviors, those magnifiers, so we're not sleeping. We're more depressed than we've been in years. We're drinking more, a lot more. You can just go hang out in the, as I did last night, in the lobby to see that happening. <laughs> um, drug use is appearing to rise. And we're doing less of the good. I was so grateful to hear the Surgeon General this morning talking about loneliness. That's a huge problem in the US. And in many ways, we've lost purpose. And we're not exercising. So those things that would help us be more, more resilient, we're not doing. And this is true not only for us as, humors, as humans, this is true for the folks who are asking to care for us, for doctors. I'm sure you've all seen and heard over the course of today, for example, how hard this is becoming for the doctors who are asking to do so much. Meanwhile, here comes a silver tsunami, and these issues are only magnified for seniors. 
and oh, by the way, we royally suck at dying. And that's really bad for everyone. So I think the goal of any movement should be to put yourself out of business. And I can't wait for the day where we hear people complaining at Health 2.0, for example. Can't someone please talk to me about my diabetes? I'm so done with learning how I could have better sex or hate my boss less. Or, thanks to you, I made it through my divorce and I'm down to two glasses of wine a night and my finances are under control. Please start lecturing me about my cholesterol again. So, how do we get there? It's really not enough to believe that this stuff is true. We have to start doing things about it. I think the healthcare industry has all the best intentions, but we're risk averse and snobby. And nobody wants to be the first and everybody hates to be the last. And so I think we need some kind of cool energy leading the way that's giving us ammunition to go back and offer to our less forward thinking execs. So this Unmentionables panel is gonna be different not only because we don't have Susanna, but because I'm gonna invite onto the stage our collective ammunition to go back to our own organizations so we can stop admiring this problem and start putting it out of business. Mark, if you'll come out and join me, is not just the CEO of Cambia Health Solutions. He's not just the chair of the board of AHIP. He's also widely regarded as one of the most genuine and visionary leaders in our space. And we are gonna ask him to be our true north and share with us where he thinks this movement's time has come and where he thinks maybe we're a little bit ahead of the game. And then we're gonna rapid fire run through a series of examples of where the unmentionables are not just a cool idea that we get to play with together once a year, but actually living and breathing programs that are changing people's lives. Mark. All right. So, let's start with the basics. Do you think we need to expand the definition of health to include life? Well, I think that health and life have always been uh, part of the same. In fact, I think that one of the ills of the healthcare system maybe over the last 50 years, is that it reduced away the life part of it and just focused on things like curing the disease that, or, or curing the injury as opposed to taking care of the patient as a whole person and understanding their life. Yeah. You know, I grew up in Spokane and, and Spokane, Washington, and my dad was a family physician. And one of the things that I observed when I would spend time in his office was how much time he took to get to know his patients and their families even the ones he wasn't treating. And I asked him one time about that and he said, the secret to a, making an early diagnosis is really knowing your patient and understanding what's going on in their life when they're not in the office, yeah. when they're not necessarily uh, dealing with a particular injury or disease. That's what gives me the ability to figure out and make those intuitive leaps to make an early diagnosis and then know how the patient wants to be treated in the midst of whatever is ailing them. Yeah. It's, at the end of the day, it's always about the entire person and their life. Well, so earlier when we were, were talking this through, um, you made a statement that I loved that, about passion leading to courage. Can you share a little bit with this crowd what, what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, to me, when we think about unmentionables, I think that with their, a big unmentionable in our industry is that there isn't enough, there aren't enough people with enough passion and courage to move beyond the brokenness of the current system and, and, and stop feasting on it and coming up with ideas that appear to be innovations but really aren't. Uh, they're just about following the money. They're just about trying to stick their cannula into the big stream of money that's going by and turn it toward them a little bit and they call it innovation. Um, there's nothing daring or courageous or noble about buying a pharmaceutical company and then jacking the price up of a 60-year-old drug. Um, you know, there's nothing noble or daring about figuring out how to milk the system uh, you know, that's, that's not functioning well for individuals and their families, but milking it because that's you know, that's good for me and I've got this little way to help a hospital make more money or a health plan make more money or be more efficient. I, don't, I, I think what I'm excited about today is that you all are gonna be in, treated to a series of people 
who I've gotten to know just recently, who are really doing something different. They're really trying to change the system. And, you know, I, 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 the overused term of disrupt, but they're going toward people. And so one of the things that has always inspired me with our company is, you know, when our company was founded 98 years ago, the people didn't know what, that they were even creating a company. They were in the timber industry in Tacoma, Washington, and they were seeing people get injured and becoming destitute and not knowing how to help them other than like bring a meal over to their house. And so they literally got together and said, what if we pool a portion of our weekly wages and put it into a common fund? They didn't know they were creating a company. They just were solving a problem. They were dealing with people. Yeah. And I think that's, today we have the same kinds of issues or new issues that demand that kind of innovation. So I think we are finally seeing, seeing a lot of evidence in the literature about the importance of the role that purpose plays in our health. Yeah. Specifically, um, people with a clear sense of purpose are happier, they sleep better, they're more likely to avoid illnesses like Alzheimer's. It's even associated with living longer. What I have so enjoyed about spending time with you is it is so clear to hear you speak how much purpose you have, what a sense of clarity you have around what you're trying to do. Can you quickly share with this crowd, how do you help infuse the people who are working with you um, with that same clarity? It's the relentless pursuit of their hearts, is what I would say. Uh, it's, it's not speaking to their minds. It's not acting from, you know, I, I assume that everyone that works for our company, or at least most, maybe myself accepted, are really pretty smart people. But they're spending most of their waking hours working. Yeah. And to me, it would be, a, it's a shame if they're not infused with a sense of passion about what they're doing yeah. and how they're, you know, and that what they're doing is for something larger than themselves, that it's really for others. So I remind them about how our company started. I remind them that, you know, it's not about protecting a business model or a revenue model. It's about serving people and it's about changing and transforming their lives. And that really does infuse a sense of purpose uh, in the company, which I think, you know, is, it's been amazing to, to watch an old company uh, become new again. Well, and I think what many of the entrepreneurs in the room who know you as an investor, since Cambia does invest in things that are aligned with their purpose, yeah. have had a chance to, to feel that also. Um, what I'm gonna do now is um, bring out we're going to dig in on the concept of caregiver stress. Many of us in this room actually know Chaira Bell, who has dedicated a huge amount of time to validating and supporting caregivers. There, are, I, I, for one, was less familiar with the company SeniorLink that has been around for close to 10 years now um, and has a, an extremely impressive revenue number, which I will let Bill share with you. I'm going to invite him out here. Um, he is one of the extraordinary souls who's helping to make that possible, and he is the EVP and Chief Development Officer. Bill. I didn't say the number, but I didn't know if you would. I think you should. Oh, yeah. I'll need the... Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Indu and Matthew from Health 2.0 and Alex Drain, our Unmentionables <laughs> resident instigator, for putting the topic of caregiving on today's agenda. My remarks today will be centered on the unpaid family caregiver, that workforce, that workforce that cares for our most fragile and complex consumers. I am a caregiver. Many of you in the room are caregivers. You know what I'm talking about. There are 66 million of us, 45 million caring for somebody over the age of 50. This commitment is not casual. It comes with great personal cost and sacrifice, and it is the most rewarding work we do. We do not submit claims for our work, so there has been very little data on the size and complexity of our workload. Our work is now estimated to total over $500 billion a year. To put that in context, the market size for government and private pay long-term care is estimated to be $225 billion a year, less than half the workload of the family caregiver. The burden of the family caregiver 
and the opportunities to engage and empower us are finally being exposed by organizations like AARP, Pew, RAND, and others. And I say thank you on behalf of caregivers who are underappreciated, underutilized, desperate, yet resolute in caring for the ones we love. Their research all points to the same conclusion. Caregivers covet the opportunity to be supported and coached. We know we can add value. We want to be part of the care team. For the next few minutes, I invite you to look through a metaphorical prism of family caregiving to begin to appreciate the untapped potential of this group of people. Please allow me to introduce you to Alice. Alice is 57. She's married. She has two grown boys and is the primary caregiver of her dad, Fred. She works full time and now averages 20 hours a week at Fred's house before and after work and on the weekends. Her own marriage is suffering. She resents her siblings who live further away. She gets no exercise, very little sleep, is stressed and even depressed at times, particularly when Fred sometimes forgets her name. Caregivers like Alice will do this job for an average of 4.6 years. Most consider it a privilege, despite the physical and emotional toll it takes on their lives. Alice will eventually help with the unmentionables of bathing and toileting her dad. The fact is, the commitment Alice makes to caregiving as Fred's dementia and physical health declines has everything to do with her mental health, not Fred's. Allow me now to look at this situation through the eyes of Alice's employer. Alice has been an excellent employee for 17 years, but seems increasingly distracted. I know her dad is sick, but she is hesitant to talk about that role she plays in his care, as if the topic is taboo. She has no idea that I have a sick mother in Florida, and I feel much of the same stress. This seems to be an alarming trend amongst my experienced managers and staff, many of whom are also caregivers. The data say that 50% of my employees with caregiving duties will routinely leave early and arrive late to work based on their caregiving demands. 66% will admit to doing some caregiving or care coordination while they're on the job. It is said procrastination is the thief of time. I'd put caregiving on that list. As I dig in to understand what this group is really costing me, I quickly learn that their claims costs are 8% higher than those of their counterparts without caregiving responsibilities. I heard somebody the other day say, sitting is the new smoking. I would submit to you that caregiving is the new smoking. I offer wellness programs that include smoking cessation. It is time I support my employees with their caregiving duties. Let's spend a minute looking at Alice's impact on Fred's cost and quality of outcomes. First, how does the medical delivery system leverage Fred's trust in Alex and her proximity to his home? She knows his diseases, how they affect him day to day, his medications, and his behaviors better than anyone. She is re ready and willing to learn new skills. She wants to be trained to do more, to monitor. How do I take advantage of Alice's skills? I am now at risk for Fred. I'm challenged by the cost of nurses and coaches assigned to my most fragile consumers as I execute my case management model. I need to invest in Alice. How do I engage her? How do I empower her? Alice is my predictive model. We should all care about caregiving. I think it's safe to say that at 2.0, Health 2.0, we all quietly wonder when we'll have an honest, action-oriented conversation about the solvency of Medicare and Medicaid. I was thrilled to hear Susanna Fox's commitment to innovation inside HHS yesterday. The migration to fee-for-value from fee-for-service is a monumental step forward in aligning resources with outcomes. To that end, we've all listened to discussions over the last two days promoting engagement and coaching. We're all looking to utilize low-cost labor to minimize and eliminate predictable, preventable complications in our most chronically ill members. Alice could cost you nothing and she has the highest level of trust with Fred. How do we put her to work for the outcomes we want and Alice want? We share the same objective. Let me spend the last minute here on SeniorLink. SeniorLink is a company started in 2005. We've been serving family caregivers with a desire to keep their loved ones at home. In our caregiver home subsidiary, much like Airbnb and Uber, we have leveraged excess capacity in the form of housing stock and aligned caregivers to create the largest virtual nursing home in the country. 
We currently operate in six states and will open our seventh in Q4. Every one of our consumers is nursing home eligible. We operate this model for approximately 50% of the cost of a nursing home bed. The model for this is a combination of caregiver collaboration technology provided to each family, custom caregiver content, and professional case management services deployed in the home. We will collect 1 million caregiver generated data assets this year. We will conduct 6,000 face-to-face caregiver interviews next month. Our senior link technology subsidiary leverages the analytics algorithms and content assets from caregiver homes. We, in December of 2014, we acquired a caregiver collaboration platform from Bell Labs. It contains a full VoIP telecom switch, care management, telemedicine collaboration channel, and a number of other features. We are designing this to promote poor man's integration. We'd like to see virtualization and search and not wait for interoperability. Our desire is to create information, put it in the hands of caregivers so they can act versus waiting on EMRs to talk to one another. We hope that that happens. We have built APIs and we will celebrate that interoperability when it comes, but people need our help now. <laughs> Finally, we have added a community resource network to assist the caregiver in the procurement of products and services required to care for their loved ones. We're deploying this technology to employers, payers, and health systems to engage caregivers empower, and empower their role in care coordination. We jokingly refer to this as the love child of Slack, Yelp, Uber, and Teladoc for caregivers. <laughs> we are excited about our future and hope you will contribute to the mission of empowering this important group of people, people like you and me. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the reasons I love SeniorLink so much is many times people will say, I love the idea of the unmentionables, but is there a business there? Is there actually a business there? And what I think he's demonstrating, and if you can find him at the cocktail hour and ply him with alcohol, maybe he will actually share with you the extent to which there is a business here. So Mark, I want to ask you this question quickly. Um, I'm thinking on everything that Bill just shared. And there are facts like in New York, for example, unpaid caregivers provide 90% of long-term care for the old and disabled, for those lucky enough to have a caregiver. Do you see this as a growing crisis? I think it's an opportunity, and I think you see it as an opportunity as well. I mean, I, I think about it and think, what if all of those caregivers were, um, you know, were, were professionalized and were being paid? Can you imagine what it would do to our healthcare system that's already um, suffering under the weight? They, these are hidden heroes. They're doing amazing work. I, I saw it in my own family when my dad was sick and my mom was his caregiver and to a lesser extent, a couple of my sisters. And it was, it was incredibly hard work and it was lonely work. Um, so yes, I think there's a great opportunity here for innovation. But, but I, I, if it just stays where it is, then it will be a crisis someday. A crisis. I would agree. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thanks. So what I'm going to do now, um, caregiving, I think we'd all agree, is a great example of an unmentionable that is coming into its own. And what used to be a category that was relentlessly pursued by so few is truly gaining momentum. And there may be no better proof point to that, specifically in the area of home care, than honor which is the darling of Silicon Valley. And next up, we have the great honor of Seth Sternberg, who is the founder and CEO. Seth. Yay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, so I'm Seth, and I'm from Honor. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing and uh, hopefully how we can really fix this problem of caregiving for our parents. So I wanna start with a story. So this is my mom. And I flew to Connecticut, which is where I'm from, and she picked me up at the airport. She's driving me home, and she's driving a little bit slower than she normally drives. And I, I said to my mom, I was like, hey, mom, why, why are you driving a little bit slower? And she said, well, driving's just a little bit harder than it used to be. And that completely freaked me out, right? I'm like, ooh, you know, my mom was in Connecticut, I live in California, how would I take care of her? How would I help her do what she wants, which is stay in her home? Because the worst thing in the world for my mother would be to have to leave her home. And I did some research and I found out that we are in the same place now, 20 years later, right? That's me with my grandmother, right? When, when I kind of went through my grandmother growing older, nothing's changed. It's still really hard to help my mom stay in her home. 
And if you look at it, we actually have shrinking families. So there are less kids to take care of our parents as they age. And those kids are moving into really expensive, really tiny apartments in big cities. So who is going to take care of our parents? Right? So we said, how can we fix this problem? What can we do about it? And when we looked into it, it's like, okay, well, if you want your mom, if you want your dad to be able to stay in their home that they love as they age, right? And 90% of seniors self-report that they want to stay at home as they age. Think about your own self. Would you want to be forced out of your home as you're getting older? Of course not. Well, you need to help people with basic things like getting out of bed, right? Or getting food or transportation or remembering to take your medicine, right? Basic things that actually keep you to the point you guys were making happy and healthy, right? And so what we've decided to do with Honor is completely remake what's called private duty home care. This is where someone comes into your home and helps your mom with things like taking medicine or getting out of bed or bathing, right? Things that are critical to be able to do to stay in your home. Now we've been live for 120 days and we've learned some really interesting lessons in the San Francisco Bay Area as we've now been providing care to people in their homes and help working with their families. And I wanna talk about those and the approach. So first off, when we created Honor, we decided that we were going to focus not just on the seniors, but also on the supports of the seniors, right? The care pros and the adult children, the family. Because if they're not in a good place, it's very hard for the senior to be in a good place. And so the first thing that we heard from people when we were thinking about Honor, they said, well, caregivers, the, the care pros, you know, the people who are paid to go into people's homes, they're untenable. Right? You're never going to be able to get them to be able to go to people's homes, show up on time. You're, this is just a bad idea. Don't do honor. But we interviewed the care pros. And this is Alex. She's a care pro on honors platform. And they all said, we want to be treated like the professionals that we are. We care for the elders in our society. Treat us like professionals. And the thing is, is that we haven't been treating them like professionals. Right? 70% of the care pros are in households that are within 200% of the poverty line. 56% are on government assistance. So if that's the way we treat the people who care for our elderly, then we are not treating our elderly well. And so what we've done for the care pros in honor is first and foremost, we've given them tools that they need to do a great job. And as they've gone out and started to work with seniors, number one thing we've heard is that you guys are giving me the tools I need to succeed. And that's things like information about the senior before they ever walk into the home, a profile on the person, and not just what their medical condition is, but who is this person? What was their profession? What was their proudest moment in life, right? So that you can relate to the elder as a person, not just as someone who needs help. Fair pay. If we're paying care pros, you know, 950 an hour on average, that, that's not so great. On Honor, we're able to pay them $17 an hour, right, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where we're currently operating. And we do that because we're using technology, right, on the, in the background to be more efficient, and then we can direct more dollars at the care post, and freedom to set their own schedules, right? So give these people the ability to be the professionals that they are. And then for the families, how do you support the families, right? Well, if you look at the kind of psychological aspects of the families caring for their parents, they feel guilty and they feel out of control. Okay, so we created an app, you can go download it in the app store if you'd like to, that, that gives them visibility, gives them control, lets them schedule care, right? Shows them a note of who came over, right? You know, Viviana came to your mom's home, this is what she did today. Here's a note that she wrote you to give you access to what's happening in your mom's home, right? Visibility and control. And there are some amazing lessons that we have learned, right? So one critical thing is your parents' needs and my parents' needs are very different, right? The needs are heterogeneous. But if you use tech to match the capabilities of a care professional with the needs of our parents, you can do incredible things, especially at scale, like someone's parent who might need someone who speaks Mandarin, who has cats in the house, so the care pro cannot be allergic to cats, who also has dementia training. And then importantly, when that person's sick one day, you can get a perfect backfill. Crazy story, when we were onboarding the care pros onto Honor's platform, they were going nuts over the I'm sick button. And I, and I asked them, why are you so excited about the I'm sick button? And they said, well, in today's world, the agencies that currently send us out, they're too small. 
they, they can't backfill us, and so we have to go to work when we're sick. And I was like, you're going into the seniors' houses when you're sick? That's really scary. We're going to fix that. Another one, a whole new capability. How can you send a care pro into a home for just an hour at a time? $25 an hour, a normal charge, paying the care pro 17 turns out not to cut it. If you use tech, you use a market, you figure out what price closes, it turns out that you can help people for just one hour at a time, right? For $35 an hour, which is much cheaper than paying for three hours of service, right? And you just pay the care pro $30, and it closes for everybody. So now Honor is able to help people in trailer parks, right? Because it is now price possible for people who can only pay for one hour at a time. Final point car. So when we went out to raise money for Honor, we heard from investors, they said, look, innovation comes from technology. And technology and the elderly don't mix. So this is a bad idea. But 50% of Honor's customers actually are directly the elderly themselves. They are signing up themselves. How is that possible? And I say to investors, well, look, you know, a car is technology. And I know a lot of seniors who drive, right? And I don't think you can build a car. So if you build technology that's really intuitive, that's a service, right, a human service, mm -hmm. then you can build something that makes people's lives fundamentally better, right? And then everyone can use it, this elderly, kids, everyone. And so I implore all of you, the investors out there, the entrepreneurs, build technology that is a human service, that makes people's lives fundamentally better, right? Everyone can use it, and I think you could, you could really change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, thank you. So I want to ask you about that. That's the first time I've actually been able to hear as much about Honor, which is obviously an extraordinary thing. So you run um, a health services company that has an insurance product. Talk, what is your reaction when you hear that? And are, you know, should we be covering caregiver responsibilities as part of health? See, I, what I love about Seth's model is, is that the whole premise is to price this service that, just as he said, is for humans. He prices it to the consumer. He prices it at a, at, you know, and he, he's done market research to find out what people can pay and are willing to pay for his service. Uh, you know, when you, it, it's always struck me as odd that when it, that in so many parts of our lives, we fully expect to pay for things that are services to us. We need an Uber, we fully expect to pay for that. We're not asking someone else to pay for it. We're not asking a larger society to pay for it. And those businesses are priced to consumer. Most of a pharmacy is priced to consumer until you get to the prescription drug counter and then it's a completely different experience. So I love the fact that, and I wish more people would do that. I've, I've had people call me and say, God, I've got this really neat new product. I just want to know whether or not, you know, you'd reimburse it, you know, on the insurance side. And I'm, I, my, my reaction to that is always, well, if you think consumers really would value your product, then why don't you try to develop it in a way that it will be priced that they can afford it? And then that usually stops them <laughs> because there's so many people who think, no, the only way I can do a product is to think about, having someone else pay for it, not the consumer. So I love this model. This is just really exciting. Well, and I think that's a great segue, actually, to our next, feature, next speaker, um, Kai Stinchcomb, who is a CEO and founder of a company called TrueLink. And Kai, you can come on out and join us. I'm going to take a second here to quickly run through what we're going to talk about. We've talked about caregiver stress. We, most of us are familiar with the notion of financial stress. I want to talk about the superstorm that is the you know, sort of caregiver stress meets financial stress in the form of financial fraud and abuse of seniors. And Kai, if you come out here quickly, um, Kai actually did a, a report when he originally got started in this space, he experienced on his own just the overwhelming response people had to how big of a problem this was. So some of you might be in the audience thinking, is this really an issue? I mean, how big is this issue? Is it a superstorm? Are you exaggerating? So MetLife back in 2011 did a study that returned a number that the size of financial fraud and abuse of seniors was $2.9 billion. Big enough that it was called the crime of the 21st century. So one of the things that I love about Kai 
is as he went out and heard people saying, this is true for me, that's true for me, that's true for me, he kept thinking in his head, well, then there's no way that it, that's, only, that's the only size that it is. So he went back and he looked at the survey tool that MetLife had used, and what he identified is what we see a lot in the healthcare space, which is the questions themselves to get people to admit that these things were true for them were shaming. They were shaming questions. It was basically saying, are you an idiot where you conned? To which most self-respecting individuals would say, oh my God, no, of course not, that didn't happen to me. So they did their own survey where they were asking questions in a way that people would admit what had actually happened. And in fact, the size of the market is not $2.9 billion, no. It's $36.48 billion, 12 times the size. And for those of you in the audience who are sitting there thinking that you have a picture in your head of who this person is, it's a little old lady, she's sitting at her kitchen table, she's beginning to struggle with dementia. It is true that dementia is a risk factor for being conned, but it's not the only risk factor. In fact, people who are financially sophisticated lose two times as much money Folks who are educated lose three to five times as much money. And those who are extremely friendly, so born in the, if I can make a gross exaggeration, 30s, 40s, and 50s, lose four times as much. Raised to be kind, raised to be trusting. Because risk ultimately, and this is Kai's words, not mine, is not just a function of vulnerability, it's a function of vulnerability plus exposure. And why I think this matters so much and why I think it's fascinating that Cambia is the lead investor, actually, in TrueLink, and we can talk about how you get paid because I think that's to Mark's point, is if you think about the stress and the health implication that that has for the senior themselves as they're going through it, then think about the implication it has as well for the person who's caring for them. And I think a little known fact is this is a great opportunity to start exploring collaborations between the financial health world and the health world in particular. The first sign of Alzheimer's is not dementia. It's trouble balancing your checkbook. Kai. Seven years ago, my family had an oh shit moment. My dad was getting old. He'd actually been getting older every day for 75 years, but somehow we managed to be surprised by this. So he wasn't surprised, though. When we flew home for a family meeting, he told me that he had just three things left that he wanted to do before he died. Wow. I asked, what were they? And he said he couldn't tell me. Wow, again. I asked why he couldn't tell me, and he said every time he got one of them done, he would take it off his list and put in a new one. Wow, a third time. Look to your left and look to your right, if you will. Consider that the people you just looked at will accomplish only a finite number of things before they die. Consider that they just looked at you. <laughs> Aging is a humiliating thing. You might lose all of your capacities at once, or you might lose them one by one, but you will lose them and losing your capacities is humiliating. Humiliating. At the peak of his career, my dad asked them to move him from the corner office to the one upstairs underneath the staircase because he knew that eventually his research wouldn't be good enough to merit the corner office, and he didn't want them to have to come and tell him that. Humiliation. Humility. Today you're going to get to know my family. This is my grandmother, Ruth. When she was 80, she lost the ability, like so many people, to form new long-term memories. So she cooks her own food, buys new clothes and mends her old ones, goes to the movies, gets ice cream, gets pizza. She just can't remember things that happened an hour ago. And in particular, she can't remember when she made her last charitable contribution. And so if you call her at 10 a.m. and persuade her to donate to your charitable cause, you can call her an hour later and say the exact same words, and she'll do the exact same thing. She'll donate again. My grandma can't afford to donate $20 an hour to charity. She's living in Indianapolis on a retired school teacher pension. My mom was at her wit's end. I said to my mom, why don't you just be more assertive with the bank? I'm sure there's something they can do about this. Why don't you just? Let me say this about the family caregiver. If you ask them, why don't you just, you're probably 
underestimating how complex the situation is and may even be in danger of being a jerk. Why don't you just be more assertive with the bank, I said. Here's what the bank told my mom and then me. They said, it sounds like Ruth is having trouble managing her money. Have you thought about taking away her credit card and her checkbook? Think about that. Think about what her life would be like without the ability to spend her own money. A checkbook is like a car. You point it in whatever direction you choose, you push down the gas pedal, and that's how fast it will go. A person with impaired vision can't safely drive a car, a person with impaired memory can't safely drive a checkbook. And if you think about how many services there are to support seniors who have lost their mobility, the ability to drive, my family was very surprised to discover that there are no services to protect seniors' financial mobility. Incidentally, this is what my company, TrueLink, does. We've developed the TrueLink card, which is a credit card that can be safely driven by somebody with any level of ability. People think of independence as not needing any support, but in fact, Independence is having the support you need. A good tool for seniors becomes part of their support system. So, getting to know my family, this is my mom, the person I admire most in the world. She's overworked, she's also a college professor. She's overworked uh, at the job, she was department chair and then director of graduate studies. She's the only person that reads the hiring committee files. She has to go through seven institutional review boards for her work, she never submits her expense reports. Um, one year, she actually decided to forego a salary so that she would have enough time to, uh, to do her job. And, and, you know, it's just one thing after another. When I dropped out of grad school to start my first company, she's the one that paid my health insurance. When my half-brother lost his job at Ford with NAFTA and started drinking, she's the one that drives him to his meetings. She drives my dad to his physical therapy. She drives to Indianapolis every six weeks when the new checkbooks have come in the mail from the bank and swipes my grandma's checkbook so that she doesn't donate to more charities. You talk about patient-centered medicine, be careful what you wish for, this is your patient. So let's talk about you know, some of the things that you might be doing. You send her a text message, why don't you just pop by the pharmacy? Why don't you just? Well, her own health is the last thing on her mind. You send her a letter, why don't you just schedule your annual? She's taking care of my mom, her mom, my father, She's just trying to get through her day. Okay, let's think outside the box. Let's talk about her stress, holistic, holistic wellness. Let's send her a gift certificate for a massage. She's not even gonna schedule the massage, and if she does, she's gonna miss her appointment. It's one more thing on her to-do list for her to feel bad about. So how do you take care of this person, my mom, your, your patient? We offer four pieces of advice. One, we have to get serious about caregiver services. You can't take care of my mom unless you take care of her family. Two, you can't offer her a menu because she's not gonna do her research. You have done your research. If you're a health insurer, an employee wellness person, you know what she needs. You have to offer her a package because you've done the research for her. Three, we have to have a conversation about aging or nobody is gonna prepare for it. Every single one of us will lose our capacity and die. And what my dad taught me is that preparing to age is preparing to make it matter in the meantime. So let's all have a plan. Let's have that conversation. And four, please buy TrueLink cards for everyone whose care you manage. They really do help. Thanks. <laughs> So that's extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to start by saying, Mark, I think this is the best example I have ever seen of investing in the products and solutions that real people want for the things that are waking them up at night. And yet you are a healthcare services company. So can you talk a little bit about how did you make the decision to be the lead investor in TrueLink? Well, what we say is that our, our, our North Star is a total health solutions company so solutions that are seamless from the point of birth to the graceful completion of life. And I, I'm sorry, but I think the financial, I guess call it the health wealth connection that I've heard some people refer to it, the financial piece is so important in terms of how a person makes it through life. And the stress, I mean, I think you had a slide in your opening about financial stress as being one of the major drivers of anxiety, stress, 
all kinds of, that leads to all kinds of health issues. And what I was struck by, we were sort of struck by when Kai came and talked to us about his company, was that it wasn't just about the, the aging person. In some ways, this was pointed at the persons who love them, who are trying to care for them and often living at distance. And if this provides a sense of security, a sense of confidence to both um, the aging mother and the people that love and care for them, that's a win. Yeah. Well, and I know you know the statistics that caregivers have twice the rate of depression, twice yeah. the risk of coming down with a chronic condition. It is a often isolating, extraordinarily overwhelming task. So to be helping them in something that often feels like a great failure that they care about so much is, is huge. And if you go onto the TrueLink site and you just really see how it works, it is so easy. It's so, it is such an elegant solution. It's yeah. very, very cool. Well, I think many of us are believers that maybe the single biggest missing ingredient in the healthcare space is empathy, Steve Jobs, true north from a design perspective. We will understand our customers' needs better than anyone else. I think that's a great, what you just described is a great example of using empathy as a true north in design. And so who we have next is one of the souls that's really bringing the most attention to the idea of using empathy in healthcare. And that's Adrian Boise, who is the Chief Experience Officer of Cleveland Clinic. So let's welcome Adrian. Hi. All right. All right. Do you have the clicker? So let's be serious. The most unmentionable thing on the stage is the leather unitard that Alex has. <laughs> 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 <Yes. Okay. laughs> All right. So uh, I'm a chief experience officer at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm a neurologist and a neuroethicist by training. If that helps you understand the different perspectives I'm hoping to bring to you today. So uh, when I was an intern, I had this experience where I was caring for this young woman and I didn't know anything. And I got to know her over the course of like a week or two and we connected. Uh, she was a jet ski instructor and she uh, had this family that just rallied around her and she had this very handsome, I didn't have a handsome boyfriend at the time, but she did, and we connected. And unfortunately, she was admitted to the hospital because she had lost the use of her legs and had a new diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Well, I didn't know anything about multiple sclerosis at the time. And one night when I was on call by myself, I got called in my call room like from the nurse, hey, you know, Joni wants to see you. I was like, well, what does she want to see me for? Like, typical. And uh, the nurse was like, well, I don't know. Just come to the bedside. And I was like, well, OK. Um, and so I went to my call room because I figured, of course, she's going to ask me questions about MS, and I wasn't going to know any of the answers. So I went to my call room first. I studied for about 20 minutes. And then I went to the bedside armed with all my knowledge. I sat down, and I said, how can I help you? <laughs> and she said, I was wondering whether or not you thought I should marry my boyfriend so that when I lose the use of my legs, I could have somebody to take care of me. And the greatest lesson from that for me was about myself, that I saw her as a body and legs, and I, I didn't see the heart of her, the face of her and it left an impression on me. Patients are not customers. And you may yank me off stage <laughs> right away when I say that. But if you have searing chest pain because your aorta is dissecting and we rush you to the ER and take care of you, you're not a customer. And if you're someone coming to see me in my clinic, you are not a customer. And if you are a customer, you're the most reluctant customer I ever met because nobody wants to come see me because I'm a multiple sclerosis specialist. People are not banging down my door for my service. And if we do think of them as customers, then what does that make me? Am I a provider of service? 
And what service? Like prescriptions or information? And there's discomfort there for me because I always thought of myself as a healer, actually. I always found me meaning in trying to reduce suffering when I saw it. And so it gives me discomfort. Suffering is a word we don't mention, and it has changed the scope of my career. And I don't know how it lands on you when I say it, suffering. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Do you lean into it, as they say? And it's really important to understand, because if we're not talking about suffering, we can never talk about the empathy and compassion that are required to ease it. And I heard words at this conference around well-being and health and isolation. And to me, those are about suffering. And we suffer, you heard several cases of how our patients suffer in innumerable ways, some avoidable and some unavoidable suffering. And you heard cases of how our clinicians are suffering. And in a brief snippet of my own sort of experiences, I give everything I have to my job. I believe deeply in it. And at the same time, I go home, and my parents are now living with us temporarily. Because they live in Virginia and can't get what they deem great care currently. And he's dying of a second cancer while he's in renal failure and just bled into his head. And my mom is watching this for the second time because my father died of the same cancer. So how do I take care of her? How do I take care of me? How do I take care of the patients I serve in the organization I am responsible for? And it's not just me, right? This went viral last year, this picture of suffering in one of our physicians who just lost a 19-year-old patient in the ER. And I guess I would just submit to you that there aren't many places for this to go for care, we call them caregivers, staff and employees, caregivers, right now. Quickly, we live in an environment where patient experience is talked about a lot, but we don't talk about patient experience. We talk about patient satisfaction in healthcare today across the country. Why? Because the government is paying for patient satisfaction performance. You should know that. Patient satisfaction, in my mind, does not equal patient experience. They're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yet we talk about them all the time like they are. We have about a decade's worth of data that we looked at when we started thinking about experience across our organization and developed a mantra of patients first. And what that looks like is access. So we have 80 million ways to find us anytime, anywhere. We have online visits. We've created stroke mobiles to bring care to patients. We've gone transparent with our data of how you can identify a clinician. But the most important effort we ever made was deciding that we weren't going to create initiatives around patient satisfaction. We were going to create initiatives about relationships in healthcare because no clinician was ever inspired by beating them up with how bad their patient satisfaction scores were. And so when I said relationships to healthcare providers, take that word back, clinicians, this is what they look like. Some got sleepy, some wondered what the heck I was talking about, some were overwhelmed, some were crabby, and, <laughs> and some were just plain skeptical. Like, relationships? Like, I'm just clicking. What are you talking about? And so I submit to you in my last 40 seconds that relationships in healthcare are incredibly important and should shape any strategy and certainly shaped ours. One, the definition in the literature of relationship-centered care is about the concept that both people bring value to the table, that there's a emotional component to what we do in healthcare, that we influence each other our patients influence me just as much as I hope to possibly influence them, and that there's something therapeutic about relationships. And so when all else fails, it will be the relationship that survives. We train 44,000 people in experience, talking about their own stories and why they have purpose in their work. We pulled 5,000 clinicians offline and spent time talking about 
communication as a means of building and fostering relationships. Because in the end, if you're going to be transparent and you're going to highlight patient satisfaction as an organizational goal, which is not my favorite idea, we need to have the, bear the responsibility of making sure we have programs that support our people in success. And to me, relationships of meaning and communication that helps foster that are what will give every single person that we treat a face and a heart. Thank you. Yeah. Well said. So that, that was extraordinary. Thank you, Adrian. Mark. Caregiving, caregivers, suffering, empathy, compassion, relationships. I agree with Adrian. It's about relationships and everything. I mean, there's, it's not, the primary relationship is between the individual patient and their family and whoever is providing service to them. And that's the one that matters the most. But I think uh, what Adrian talks about is, is also the importance of relationships across and weaving you know, together everyone who is working together to try to create that. I, very moving. Yeah, I think after something like that, you almost just want to say nothing and let that just hang and let yeah. us all digest for a second what she said. That was extraordinary. So some of you might remember when we shared last year that the genesis of the idea for the Unmentionables was actually one day I was driving to work late and I saw a man walking on the side of the road holding the hand of a little girl and I looked at him, I don't know why I was so struck by him, and what I started noticing in my head is I ticked off all of the conditions I was pretty sure he had, you know, diabetes, clearly hypertensive, at risk of a heart attack, and what hit me as I drove by, this beautiful little girl, he's holding the hand, he's walking, it's 10.30 in the morning, I realized, oh my gosh, with all the best intentions, my company's gonna reach out to this guy and we're gonna try and help him. We're gonna lecture him about things he needs to do and the medication he needs to take and the tests he's gotta get going. And I realized this guy doesn't need a lecture. This guy needs a job. And the first time we said that out loud, and since we've often laughed, like, well, that's ridiculous, the healthcare system, it's a great idea, but no one's ever gonna do that. Well, I don't know if that's true. So I want to invite out onto the stage Karin Van Zandt, who is the Executive Director of Life Services at CareSource and has her own story to share. Good afternoon. Thank you um, all for staying late and being a part of this. Haven't the, uh, the panelists been wonderful? Um, really good information. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a topic, as, as Alex said, about um, job creation in the health arena. And I thought the best way to talk about this is to tell you a little bit about my own life. So I'm going to take you back to 1995, the roaring 90s. I was 20 years old. I was a junior in college. I was actually a pre-med major um, on the fast track to uh, being an orthopedic surgeon. And um, my husband and I found out that we were pregnant. We were like most um, college students, and we didn't have any health insurance. Uh, we had campus jobs, and we were taking a lot of credit hours to try and get through that undergrad as quickly as possible. And we didn't know exactly what we were gonna do. So we signed up for Medicaid and started preparing for a baby. It was a pretty scary proposition. A lot of the, the folks that I was in school with uh, continued to move forward, and, and I felt stuck. I was a 4.0 student, and I was failing miserably at the welfare system. Now, obviously, things have turned around a little bit. I mean, evidently, I'm up here. They don't just let anybody up on this stage. Um, but what I've spent the last 20 years doing is working in that broken system, that broken welfare system, and working with low-income people to figure out all of the complexities that are there. Now, you may be asking yourself, what does that have to do with health? Well, I'm going to pose this simple question to you. If you found out today that you no longer had a job, how would that impact your health? And there have been lots of studies, lots of research that has shown how losing a job 
whether it's of your own accord or not, can impact significantly your health in a very, very short amount of time. Very short amount of time. So as I've been working with low-income people, many of whom are healthy for the most part, able-bodied for the most part, but significantly undereducated and underskilled, one of the things that I've found is that helping them to connect with a sense of purpose, a sense of pride, and specifically a paycheck is the fastest anti-poverty program that's out there. In January of this year, CareSource, the largest managed care Medicaid provider in Ohio, decided they were going to do something about workforce development as it pertains to the 1.4 million Medicaid members. They decided that they were going to add a new dimension to their health care services and offer financial and social stability services to those members who were willing and able and motivated to explore what it would look like to get a job. It's been only nine months, so the, the data is, is fairly small comparative to the data that I've been hearing about all day at this conference. But what I can tell you about our members is that when they come voluntarily and when they're connected with the right opportunity, amazing things can happen. Our members are really tapping in to that sense of purpose, the sense of purpose that brings many of us to conferences like this, that sense of purpose about what can we do for the next thing, how can we change tomorrow for ourselves and for others. It's also connecting them to a paycheck and not a minimum wage paycheck. When you do the math for minimum wage, if you're a single parent, the math does not add up. At 40 hours a week, if you can find a minimum wage job at 40 hours a week, not taking any time off for vacation or sick, not taking any time off for your kids, you're bringing home less than $15,000 a year. But you bump that dollar amount up to $12 or $13 an hour, and all of a sudden you're in the $25,000, $27,000 range, and a lot of things can really happen for folks that, who are underemployed or unemployed before once they start. And what's different about those employers is that employers that are offering their employees 11, 12, 13, 14 dollars an hour, that's their starting. But they're looking to invest in those employees and keep them moving up the ranks so that in a year or two, they're making 15 or 17 dollars an hour. It's interesting what can happen when you work with a 35-year-old who's only ever worked part-time minimum wage and you take all of the effort that she's putting into that job you put her into a 40-hour-a-week job, has full benefits, has advancement opportunities, and within a very short amount of time, everything about her changes. The way that she talks to her kids change. The way she holds herself change. The possibilities and the potential changes. I think that the next verge of the unmentionables, as we've talked a lot today about the silver tsunami, is that what you called it? Wow, that's the first time I've heard that. I'm definitely not from the healthcare arena, you can tell. <laughs> is how are we going to start connecting people as the baby boomers leave the workforce? How are we going to start connecting people to fill those jobs? And then how are we going to support them and encourage them to stay connected to those jobs? And how are we going to then help their children to not ever know a life of Medicaid or of food stamps or of poverty. Thank you for this time today. Enjoy the rest of your conference. So I'm in love with you. That's extraordinary. Thank you so much. So what an example, right, of meeting people where they are. Don't lecture me about all the things I should do about my health. Help me get a job. Help me get a job. So before we ask BJ to come out and join us, I want to take a few more minutes to think about this together, and I don't think we can leave Karin and what she just shared without asking you. Karin, Life Services, what say you? Well, I think I love the idea of a, a person coming into a doctor's office and getting a script to go see Karin and, and, and say, part of your healing is going to be, we're going to help you get a job. 
And the idea of creating that connection, I mean, it, it's very much resonant with what we've been talking about today, but um, very innovative. So you have made a career of not just talking about the things that matter the most, um, but are being ignored, but then going ahead and actually taking them on. Mm -hmm. So in the spirit of let's put at least the stage of the unmentionables out of business, I would love if you could share with this crowd how you convinced your board to help you take on the issue of advanced care, end of life, palliative care, at a time when the issue was considered toxic, if not a third rail? Uh, well, a lot of what we've done as a company when we started, uh, we were uh, taking on things that people felt were you know, a waste of time or a waste of money. Uh, and they've turned out to be what everyone is talking about today. Uh, and, and so I think our board was conditioned to that a little bit when I came up with this one. But, you know, we had a conversation about, you know, their own parents and the struggles that they had had going through life uh, as their parents were aging, as they were um, maybe fighting the battle, the last battle of their lives. Uh, that often it seemed like it was more of a struggle, that the conversation was much more about the illness and what are we going to do about the illness as opposed to what matters to you? How do you want to live with this illness? What are the, your goals? And focusing on, on the person and realizing that, that healing is not just about effecting a cure, that it's much more so about how the person goes through the illness. So we had that conversation at the management team and we took that to the board. And the proposal was that we're gonna lean into this not as a business proposition. We're gonna start with um, within our foundation and it was gonna be about how do we change the, the way in which caregivers, hospitals, and the like um, do this work. And, and, and we would invest directly into them to help increase their competency level because it needed to start there. And so we made, uh, have made over the years a series of very significant grants to teams within health systems who were dying to move forward on this, but they didn't have the support of their administration who didn't believe that it was really valuable. And by, so we invested in them we brought in a team from UCSF who was one of the best in the world in this, and we helped train them. And in 100% of the cases where we've seeded that, the administration of those health systems has embraced it and now has taken it forward. So then, you know, we've done that. Now, now we brought in our health plan and we're reimbursing for uh, both, you know, in, in community-based, not just end of life, because palliative care is something that needs to go hand in hand with curative care. So if I remember correctly, well, I will start by saying I think you do a wonderful job talking about the importance of stories, that we all have stories, that our stories shape who we are and they shape what we do. And you have a story. And I think you asked your board to share their stories as part of this process. Yeah. Yeah, well, well my story is uh, about, is relates to my mom, uh, which, she, after my dad died, uh, she went through a series of, she had a heart attack and then stroke and really struggled. I think the caregiving for dad kind of wore her out. And uh, so she developed congestive heart failure. And, and I think those of you in the audience who know about, and maybe you know people with congestive heart failure, it's a very long, slow process where you'll be going along and then just like a, you'll have a crisis and then you just never quite recover from that crisis completely and it's sort of a stair step down. One of the things we felt as a family, and I'm the youngest of six kids, is, boy, it was like every time my mom ended up in a hospital, it was like this, uh, talk about a tsunami of care and diagnostic stuff that was thrown at her. And, and it was very difficult to kind of hold them back and say, no, 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 focus on what's really her issue as opposed to all this other extra stuff. And, uh, but my mom was very as she got closer and closer to the end of her life, she, she was a person of faith, she was ready. She was ready and willing to keep living as long as, as she could, but she was also not afraid of dying and, and was very accepting of that. 
But one of the things that she insisted on when she went into the hospital for, for these various times was that there would, they would post the, the do not resuscitate um, manifesto or order on her door because the thing she feared the most was um, having her heart stop and then you know, having a full code done on her. She was ready to go. Uh, so she went into the hospital, as, as it turned out, for the last time, and sure enough, uh, one evening, her heart stopped. And uh, they did a full code on her. They came right in, full code. And when we arrived at the hospital later, you know, we were like, what the <clears throat> were you doing? And they hemmed and hawed and, you know, claimed they didn't see the sign. Well, no, it's right on the door. It's also in her chart. And what it really came down to was we didn't want her to die on our shift. And to me, that's, you know, a classic example of um, who were they caring for? <laughs> uh, and who was most important in that? And just the little time it would have taken to notice what she really wanted and embed that into the care team would have been made a real difference. So that really fired my passion around this and saying that while that was at an end of life situation, the palliative care, I believe that if it, it had been done right all the way along, along with the curative treatment she was receiving, um, I think she would have gotten less curative interventions because she didn't really want them. Um, I think the teams would have worked together better, and it surely would not have ended up in that very, very unfortunate end uh, to, of her life. So it's, it's, a, it's a time that, it's an idea that when we really started leaning in, it was radioactive, but I really believe it's, a, it's an idea whose time is coming, that people get it, that it's about respecting people's wishes, it's about listening to them, and it's about ensuring that if this is a disease that may kill them, that by God, they will live through it gracefully. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, there may be only one person in the world who could do justice to the story that you just said in continuing the arc of what I think has been an extraordinary um, series of folks sharing their stories, and that would be the executive director of the Zen Hospice Project, B.J. Miller. Um, B.J., if you can come out here. Who is arguably, outside of Atul Gawande, the one person doing the most to build additional momentum in the end of life and advanced care space. About a couple months ago, maybe six months ago, five months ago, B.J. spoke at TED the talk he gave was released, I think, about three weeks ago. It's already well over a million views. We are assigning homework as part of the Immensuables this year that you are to watch his TED Talk. It is an extraordinary thing, and we're so honored to have you, BJ. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, it's a great joy to be here, guys. This is, uh, thank you, Alex, for the invitation. It's a joy to be anywhere near you, leather or not. And, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> And Mark, what an honor. What